Winner, winner. Chicken dinner. Alrighty, um, question for you guys to start off, alright? What, uh, what do you think the definition of happiness is? Happiness. Anybody? What, just define happy, or throw out some words that when you think of the word happy, like, this is happiness. Joyful, Joyful okay. A little different, but happiness. Go, shout them out. Take it out for Something that makes you smile. Something that makes you smile, okay. Sure. I smile when I'm happy. Chris Kyle. Uh, something that makes you laugh. Something that makes you laugh, smile, okay, yes. I like it. Keep going. Be content with what you have. Content with what you have, okay. All right. That's a very mature definition of happiness. What else makes you happy? Or what, what is happiness? Getting money, okay. Yeah, moneyness, moneyness. Money can equal happiness sometimes. Uh, you know, money can buy you a jet ski. Jet skis make me happy. All right, here maybe a little bit of an easier question rather than defining happiness. What makes you happy? Food. Food. Okay. Lemons. Oh, they said lemons. So that is so random. Okay. For this one, raise your hand. For this one, raise your hand. Raise your hand. What makes you happy? Sam. Sam makes you happy? Aw, that's so cute. Frankie. Sports. Okay, sports make me happy. Netflix. Okay, question. Have you ever watched Netflix for so long that it's like, huh, are you still watching? I'm like, yes, I'm still watching. Okay, what else makes you happy? And both your friends. Sleeping in. Sleeping in. Glory. Okay, um, I wrote down a few of mine. Uh, six flags. Do you know six flags? True state of euphoria is X2. Just going down that ride. Oh, it's good. What about Disneyland? I went to, I went to Biola. At Biola, I had a Disneyland annual pass for three years. It was awesome. When you're 15 minutes from Disneyland, you can be like, hey, I'm bored right now. Let's go to the happiest place on earth. Great answer. Um, Giants. San Francisco Giants. When, when they win. When they win. Three World Series in five years? Come on now. That's happiness right there. Um, what about movies? Movies? Uh, I love I love movies. I love movies. Movies make me happy. Uh, there's something about you know the escape of real life and just going into a movie for a little bit. What about food? What types of food? Pizza, chocolate, in and out, lemons, waffles. Okay. All right, all right, all right. Hey, listen up, listen up, listen up. This this past weekend, I was uh, I was at a wedding in Washington, and we at weddings generally there's really really good food, which there was at this wedding, and it was catered by this place called Michael's by the Water, and there was like the most wonderful spread of food. It was glorious. Um, it was like there was you know some beef cut so well and nice and tender on the inside. There was a whole thing of salmon. There were like potatoes. And it was just like this spread of food that was so good. Here's the funny thing though. Here's the funny thing. As good as that meal was, as good as that meal was, not only like, or not even like four or five hours later, we were at my sister's house and we had just, mind you, we had just eaten this massive meal. We get to my sister's house and she's like, I'm hungry. I was like, how could you possibly be hungry? We just had that. She's like, I want a pizza. You want a pizza? And it's like 12.30 in the morning. She's like, I want to make pepperoni pizza. And she goes into her freezer. She grabs these two pepperoni pizzas, throws them in the oven, and I'm like, all right, you know, I'll eat them with you. And we sat there at 12.30 in the morning, and me, her, and some of her friends, and we ate this pepperoni pizza. And it made me laugh, because I was thinking about how, like, how happy food makes me, but how, like, fleeting it is. Right? If you're anything like me, you'll eat breakfast and you'll be like, oh my gosh, that was so good, I love breakfast. And then like an hour later, you're like, is it lunch time yet? And you're like, I'm, I'm seriously hungry. And then you eat lunch and you're like, oh, that was so good. And then you're like, is it dinner yet? And then you eat dinner and then you're like, is it cereal time yet? Is it 10 o'clock? 
Formians, that's the key. That's the key right there to success. Formians. Um, but happiness, all these things that you guys mentioned, hey, listen up, listen up. All these things that you mentioned, like Six Flags, other things that I mentioned, they can make you happy for a moment, but then it's kind of gone, right? It's kind of that, that Christmas feel where you're like, open up your presents, and you're like, this is the coolest thing ever. And then like six days later, you're like, eh, like I'm kind of over it. So I was thinking about, the, okay, what, what is the type of happiness that lasts? Like, what's the, the happiness that, like, continues to go on? And I thought of the word satisfy. Satisfy. Okay? And I was thinking, okay, what satisfies me? Not just something that, like, I get and then I just want again right away, but what actually satisfies me? And I was thinking of the word that the Bible uses a lot for that, and it's, it's blessed. Okay, and it's, it's this word blessed, and as I looked at the definition, and it says it's more than a temporary or circumstantial feeling of happiness, okay, like a lot of those other things we talked about, but it's a state of well-being in relationship to God that belongs to those who respond to God's ministry, or to Jesus' ministry. So more than a temporary or circumstantial feeling, but it's a state of well-being in relationship to God. Okay, so this is one of those things that, you know, maybe not everything is going well in life. Maybe not everything is, like, going according to plan. And there's not that, like, smile on my face. Or maybe I'm not laughing. But there's still a state of well-being. There's still a sense of, like, everything's okay. Because I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied. I'm being fulfilled. There's this, there's this contentness inside of me, right? So as I look more into this, there's, there's a section in the Bible that talks about a, a lot of blessed. It says, blessed is this, blessed is this, blessed is this. And it's something called the Sermon on the Mount. Hey, we doing okay over here? We good? I realize this is the first time I've spoken on a Tuesday night. So we're going to set a stage here where, you know, we might have some fun playing games. We might have some fun in here. But then when it comes to this time, we're going we're gonna to dive into God's Word. Okay. And this is a book that, that demands respect, okay? And so what I'm going to have you guys do is we're going to sit here. And I'll never talk for more than like 20, 25, maybe 30 minutes on a, on a really good night, okay? And for those 30 minutes, I'm just going to ask that you guys listen, okay, and are respectful to both to me but to God's word more than me, okay? Can we do that? Yes? Awesome. Okay. So there's a, there's a section in the Bible, Matthew 5, if you have your Bibles with you. If you don't have your Bibles with you, I'm going to challenge you guys to bring this book with you. Because all year, every Tuesday night, we're going to be diving into this book. Every time. It's, you're not coming here to listen to what I have to say. Okay? But you're coming here for, for me. I'm, I'm just a, a messenger. I'm just up here. I'm going to dive into God's Word. I'm going to study it the best I can. And I'm going to relay this message to you guys. But it's really important that you guys bring this with you. So that it's not just something that you're hearing on Tuesday nights. But it's something that you can be diving into every single day. And maybe if you bring it with you, you can underline something, you can write a little note in the side of it so that when you read it on Wednesday or on Thursday or on Friday or any other day that's not Sunday or Tuesday, you can think back to what we learned in God's Word on that day, okay? Aye? Aye. Cool. All right, Matthew 5. Okay, Matthew 5 is the beginning of something called the Sermon on the Mount, okay? And the Sermon on the Mount is, is this... A couple chapters in the book of Matthew where Jesus just kind of goes off. And it's this really long message where if you can imagine Jesus sitting with his disciples and a bunch of other people that came to listen to him, they just all sit down on this hillside and he sits down and he kind of turns their world upside down. And in this, in this section, Jesus says a lot, you've heard that it was said, but I say. You've heard that it was said, but I say. You've heard that it was said and he kind of takes their world and he says, hey, this is how you do things. And he kind of turns it on its head and says, but this is how I do things. And the crazy thing about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus claims to be God. So that Jesus is the son of God, but he also claims to be God. And because he is God, he has the authority to say these things. So in Matthew 5, it starts out, it says, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We're going to stop right there. In verse 1, it says, His disciples came to him. One definition that I want to just, all year long, I'm going to repeat. And if you were with us last year, you would have heard it as well. We want to define a disciple here as, as a humble servant committed to following Jesus. The disciple of Jesus is a humble servant committed to following Jesus. 
And so that for me would be my desire for each and every single one of you. That's my desire for my life. That God, how can I be a, a disciple of Jesus? How can I be someone who follows Jesus? Who I look at Jesus and I say, man, that's the guy I want to follow with my life. And that's what it really means to commit your life to Jesus. Maybe you've heard the term that I accepted Jesus into my heart or that I'm a Christian or, you know, there's a lot of different terms where you can be like, okay, what, what do all those mean? What, what it really means to be a Christian, what it means to accept Jesus into your heart is to daily commit to following Jesus. To say, I'm going to be a disciple of Jesus who is a committed or is a humble servant committed to following Jesus. So it says his disciples came to him and he stands up and he starts talking to him and he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed is the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Remember we talked about a little bit about how Jesus kind of turns everything upside down. He starts off right off the bat right here. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What do you mean blessed are the poor in spirit? We just define blessed as it's more than a temporary circumstantial feeling. It's this state of well-being. And Jesus starts out by saying, hey, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. You're like, what? Like, no, no, no. It's, it's about like being in a good mood and like liking it and feeling good about it and right and Jesus starts out and he says no 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 blessed are the poor in spirit okay what does it mean to be poor in spirit poor, the poor in spirit are those who recognize they're in need of God's help the poor in spirit are those that recognize that they're in need of God's help it says theirs is the kingdom of heaven it belongs to those who confess their spiritual bankruptcy okay do you know what bankruptcy is in, in a financial term money when a, when a business declares bankruptcy, what does that mean? They run out of money. Ran out of money, right? They don't have any more money. Okay, they got nothing left. Okay, so this is saying, Jesus is saying, blessed are those who confess their spiritual bankruptcy. Those who get to the point where you're like, man, I got nothing left. I got nothing. God, like, it, it's got to be you. He's saying, blessed are those people who reach rock bottom spiritually and say, I, I can't do this. Okay, this, this right here, as I was thinking about this, it can go one or two ways, okay? I think this, this idea, this concept can go, can go two different ways. One of them is that you say, you look at the Sermon on the Mount and you read through it, and it kind of, it sets a pretty high standard. It, you know, you talk through divorce, you talk through giving to the needy, you talk through anger, you talk through lust, it talks through all these different things, and it sets this standard that's pretty up there. And you can look at this and you can say, Man, that is, that is way too hard. There's no way I can possibly do that, so I'm not even going to try. That's, that's one way you can go. The other way that I think sometimes Christians go or, or followers of Jesus go is, you know, you, you kind of look around and you go, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that bad. Like, I'm, I'm looking around and I see those people and they're like doing those bad things and I don't do those bad things, so, so I'm okay. Maybe I'm not like on the level of the guy who sits in the front row with both hands up during worship, like, Maybe I'm not that spiritual, but I'm, I'm definitely not as bad as these guys over here. And you kind of like get yourself in this comfortable place and you're like, all right, cruise control. I'm good. Right there. And, and you kind of justify, and you're like, I'm, I'm all right. I'm, I'm doing okay. You can read your Bible and you'd be like, okay, like I can get some good things out of there, but like I don't struggle with this, this, and this, so I'm doing all right. So the one extreme is like, that's way too difficult. There's, there's no way I can do all that, so I'm not even going to try. The other extreme is like, I don't really need to do all those things. I'm doing okay because I'm not as bad as those people over there. What this is saying, what the Bible says is, it says, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who reach the point where you're not saying, man, I'm okay. You're not saying that's too hard. I'm going to quit. But saying, man, this is hard. This is difficult. It's not easy to be a follower of Christ day in and day out. But God, I, I want to do this by your power. I want to do this because Jesus lived a life and died on the cross and now lives within me and by his power, by his strength, I can accomplish these things. The crazy thing about Jesus dying on the cross for us is, is the fact that he gave us the ability to, to be in relationship with God through him. That when you think about sin, when you think about each and every one of us, we all have sin in our lives. We all have this brokenness within us that dates all the way back to Adam and Eve, Genesis in the Bible. And God is a God who always has been, always will be, perfect God. And the thing about a perfect, holy God is he can't be anything with sin. He can't have anything to do with that sin. So what Jesus did is he created a way back for us. 
And that through Jesus, we can take these principles of the Bible that are taught in the Sermon on the Mount, and we can actually live them out, not on our own strength, not because we try so hard and we do so well, but because of Jesus. Because Jesus is teaching these things and saying, hey, this isn't a list of things that you check off, and once you check off all these things, then you'll have a relationship with God. And he says the exact opposite of that. He says, man, come to me exactly how you are. If you're in an area where you're just broken, you're hurting, and things aren't going right, stuff at home is jacked up, and you're saying, man, like, I need to clean all this up so that then I can be a good Christian. No, that's not what Jesus says at all. Here Jesus is saying, man, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who recognize on their knees, man, Jesus, I cannot do this without you. There is no stinking way I can do this without you. Jesus, I need you. Man, when was the last time you had that desperation for Jesus? When was the last time you were like, man, I, I, I cannot do this life. I cannot walk through today without Jesus. That's what he's saying here. Blessed, a true state or a sense of, of happiness, of joy, of long-standing kind of wellness within you. Blessed are the people who realize you need me desperately. And why do we need Jesus? Because you look at this standard that God sets and you say, there's no way I can do that without him. There's no way I can live day in and day out, not be on cruise control, not quit, but to say, man, today I'm going to work hard at this. How am I going to work hard at it? But through my relationship with Jesus, through knowing who Jesus is, through being a, a humble servant committed to following him. Um, I played sports growing up. I played, uh, I played soccer, played basketball, played volleyball. And I always hated the beginning of the season. I always hated the part where, you know, you show up to practice and you're like super out of shape and you're like, dang, we got to start running. And I remember, I remember an instance where, you know, you kind of get to practice and you're like, okay, I ran like once this summer, so I'm, I'm pretty good. You know, I'm doing all right. Uh, and then you look at the guy who's been like, you know, running all summer long and is in like stellar shape and is like doing the sprints no problem. You know, and you're like, dang, like I'm not on that level. And then you look at the other guy who's like puffing and puffing and you're like, okay, like, better than that guy. You know, you get to that point where you're kind of like playing that compare game while you're all trying to get into shape, right? While you're all trying to prepare for this sport. And as I was thinking about this concept of you know, a lot of the times we, when we come together as a youth group like this, we can kind of treat our relationships with God like that. We can treat them like, you know, we kind of look around and we kind of place ourselves on this like line of like, okay, like I'm, I hang with this crew and we do this and we're like, okay, we're pretty in shape. Maybe we're not as in shape as those people, but we're better than those people. And I really want to set the standard this year that, man, this is a group of people that's, man, this thing's driving me nuts. I'm sorry. Okay, good. Uh, th th this is a group of people that, that comes together on Tuesday nights to just dive into God's word, to learn and to grow together. Like imagine if this group of people that's here tonight, all of us, we just said, man, we are humble servants committed to following Jesus. Like we want to dive into God's word every single day. Every single week, we want to come here, we want to be committed to learning, and then we're going to go out. We're going to go into our schools, we're going to go into our sports teams, we're going to go what, like wherever we go in life, and we're going to be a group of disciples that then makes disciples of Jesus. I think that would be rad. That would be the coolest group of people that would come together and not compare ourselves to each other, not look at each other and judge one another, not call each other out on things that are unnecessary, but call each other out in love to say, Hey, like, remember at youth group we learned this, and like, you're not really living it that way. Not because you're you're saying it as gospel or anything, but just saying it because you love one another, right? The Bible says, "Iron sharpens iron." One man sharpens another as iron sharpens iron. That we would all challenge each other to live more like disciples of Jesus. I want to finish tonight by reading a verse um, that I stumbled upon in First John. If you've been with us on, on Sunday mornings, you've been studying a little bit in 1 John, and, and those are some incredible books to start in. And if, if you're with us tonight and you weren't with us on Sunday morning, something we challenged on Sunday morning is if you don't know how to read your Bible or where to start in your Bible, sometimes it can be kind of daunting to open that thing up to like Genesis at the beginning, and, and maybe you get through Genesis, maybe Exodus, and you get to Leviticus, and you're like, wait, what? 
like sacrifices, and I don't really understand this thing. You know, there, there's some tough stuff in here. There is. But a really cool place to start is 1 John. If you don't know where that is, there's a table of contents in every Bible. If you don't have a Bible, ask us. We'll give you one. Promise. Free. You can take it home. Look at the table of contents, 1 John. And there's some awesome things in that book. And, and this is just what I want to read to you tonight. I'm going to read it to you two times. The first time is in ESV, which my Bible is in. And it says this. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. And I was thinking about this verse, and the reason I wanted to share it with you guys is because we talk about this idea of being humble servants committed to following Jesus. And man, a lot of you in this room have made that decision to say, I want to follow Jesus. I want to be a disciple of Jesus. Maybe it was at Glow Stick Olympics last year. Maybe it was at March Madness this past year. Maybe at Hume at some point. But a lot of you in this room have made that decision to say, I want to follow Jesus. That wants to, that, that's something that I want to make a part of my life. And if you haven't made that decision before, that's okay. That's all right. And I hope that by coming to youth group and by hanging out with your awesome hub group leaders, that that can be something that you decide this year. That can be something that you want to take seriously this year. But I wanted to read this to you because once you make that decision, it's not an easy road, but it's the best road. It's not an easy life, but it's the best life. But it's a hard one. And day in and day out, there's going to be two things that are kind of vying for your attention. There's going to be the spiritual, there's going to be the spirit, and there's going to be the flesh. This verse talks about it as kind of God's abiding in God, having a relationship with God, and the world. And it talks about not loving the world and the things in the world, but loving God instead. And it's talking about this battle that kind of goes on. And I want to read it to you one more time in the message. I want you to think about that. That day in and day out, there's going to be this battle that goes on of, am I going to pay attention to the things in this world? Am I going to pay attention to the things that this world says are important? Or am I going to pay attention to my relationship with God? Am I going to pay attention to being a disciple of Jesus and being committed to that? And reading God's word and spending time in prayer and worshiping God and finding joy in him. And that battle's going on. Listen to this in the, in the message. Don't love the world's ways. Don't love the world's goods. Love of the world squeezes out love for the Father. Practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, or wanting to appear important, has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from him. The world and all its wanting, wanting, wanting is on the way out. But whoever does what God wants is set for eternity. I love that line. Love of the world squeezes out love for the Father. Jesus says over and over and over again, he says, I'm not going to be an accessory to your life. I'm not just going to be something you add on. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Nobody gets to the Father except through me. Nobody gets to the Father unless you're 100% in, unless you're committed and saying, man, I'm all in. Jesus, I'm not, I'm not going to have you as a backseat driver. I'm not going to have you as just someone that's along for the ride. And you're like, Jesus, I'm going this way. Like, come on. But Jesus says, I'm driving. I'm driving the car. Give me the keys. I'm going full steam ahead. And that's what Jesus wants. He wants for you to be a humble servant committed to following him daily. And day in and day out, we would say, man, that's what we're committed to. That's what we're about. Pray with me. God, I thank you for tonight. Thank you that we can just come and we can have a ton of fun playing dodgeball and just being silly on stage and just having a ton of fun here, God. But I also thank you that we can just have a serious time too, that we can open up your word and that we can learn from it. God, I thank you that you bring us something that is deeper than happiness. That you do bring us happiness and you can put a smile on our face. God, even in those times that are hard, even in those seasons that are difficult, that God, that you are still in the midst of those as well, teaching us and molding us. God, I thank you so much for this group of junior hires and for this group of leaders that's here tonight. God, I pray that this year, 
would be a year where we're committed to following you, where we're committed to learning daily. God, we love you so much. Thank you for your son, Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys are dismissed. You guys are